2016 that any company at any level can create some AI for where any question which you have, they'll have the answer, or any job which you can imagine, they'll be able to do that job. To me, that is just completely unrealistic. So if not that, who then is supposed to do those jobs? And that's why I think these highly specialized vertical AIs that can do one thing, but that one thing extremely well, will start to arrive. There really isn't a standard tool set yet. And people are working it out on their own. Uh, so I think one of the keys is uh, to be able to do tests, to be able to have some feedback, to have some uh, uh, standard data sets to understand how well you're doing. Some of the places where you see machine learning uh, go the most wrong is when you don't have that feedback loop. I think it's important to have humans in the loop for uh, feedback uh, because uh, the systems aren't living life as a human. So it's harder for them to know exactly what it is that they want. So if you begin with a vector for man with glasses, subtract the vector for man and add the vector for woman, you get the vector for woman with glasses. And by decoding slight variations on that vector, you can get several different images of women with glasses. In this case, it's somewhat more impressive that the arithmetic in vector space actually works because we actually need to decode the vector that results from the arithmetic and get an image where all of the pixels actually make sense. There are so many images being, getting uploaded into the web uh, that we should start doing this uh, using computer vision. And I hope this kind of convinced you that computer vision is ready to be used in this type of work um, and we'll call this you know computational visual sociology or something like that where people haven't done this before but we think they should start doing it those are pre-trained on thousands of people so that they will work with any new candidate image that you apply to it uh, this is what the corner of the eyes generally look like right this is what people's chin lines generally look like now if you have someone like me who has a beard uh, those chin lines you're not going to match those very well and so your algorithm is going to have to compensate for that but in general the tools that are out there can handle beard, glasses, et cetera, all kinds of issues uh, very, very well. So the GitHub repo has like public source code for extracting features on multi-threaded GPUs. Uh, so we use Torch for that, uh, but uh, and it's based on Lua. Uh, but so the model we use is a VGG net, but it's not state of the art anymore. So uh, recently I have actually switched that to a ResNet 101 model, a residual neural network. And I'm in the process of experimenting uh, with that to extract features. You know, we're smart. We are developing AI. We're the future. It's, it's amazing. Uh, we might have the, the tendency to uh, like tell our uh, stakeholders, we will develop the system, it's gonna be perfect. Uh, come see me back in two years, it's gonna be amazing. That won't work. Uh, implementing the systems then, the use cases is a very, very bad idea. We also need to keep the context in, in mind and to test. We are going to um, make the phrase vector by averaging the word vectors in the phrase. And there are um, other ways to make phrase vectors such as uh, you can first train the TensorFlow to do the machine translation and then retrieve the hidden state. We added deleted convolution that is uh, a new uh, feature. Uh, for the multiple uh, GPU, uh, we use Nicol to implement synchronous updates uh, still uh, via Platoon. So if you want to use multiple GPU, but you don't want to lose the deterministic aspect of your implementation, you can do it now. On the other hand, with convex optimization, there's only one unique um, optimal value. Uh, with tensor uh, decomposition, there are multiple optimal values, but they all turn out to be, you know, to a global. And so that's the difference between the two. You don't have to be able to implement all the algorithms for production but you should have a very good idea of how they all work. And I think artificial intelligence, a modern approach, or half dozen other books, and the open courseware stuff from MIT and the stuff from Stanford, it's a, it's a year's worth of work to get up to the speed to the point where you can use the tools I've been talking about effectively. And what we're trying to ensure is that their error is minimal or it is in a dimension that we don't care about. 
And so they have some output, which then we compare to our golden output. And we can ensure that their production stack or their production implementation of our research um, is perfect. And so far, we can do these kinds of things to get to the level of machine precision um, or, or machine error in between the stacks. So again, reinforcement learning is very, very, very different. Very like galaxies away from just supervised learning. They're very different things. I just I want to make that dead clear. Uh, don't don't try to learn both at the same time. Like these are very different things. Start with a basic NLP and then do then do LSTMs. Do not start with LSTMs. I've been coding since I'm 10 years old. I've been doing machine learning since I'm 18 years old. I'm 31 now, so it's quite a lot of time. And homomorphic crypto is one of the technologies, probably the technology that got me the most excited after machine learning. Good luck, everybody. These are really hard problems. Don't give up. I don't have a PhD. I don't think you need one. Some people say you do. So let that inspire you to uh, tackle these problems and come up with new tools and techniques because the impacts can be incredible. Thanks. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Bye. Cheers.